following is an HCPSS TV special presentation. Hello and welcome to HCPSS Insight. My name is Brian Bassett and today I welcome Dr. Michael J. Martirano, HCPSS Interim Superintendent of Schools. Though only on the job a few weeks, Dr. Martirano has jumped in with both feet. Today, you'll get to know more about the background, the priorities, and vision of our new superintendent. Dr. Martirano, thank you for joining me. I'm thrilled to be here. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the county right now and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. There sure is and let's jump in right here. Okay. An important issue arose um, during really the first week of commencements, and it's, it's something that quickly began spreading on Twitter, and I'm hoping that yeah. you can sort of clear it up here. So yes or no, pineapple on pizza? Absolutely not. <laughs> My goodness, start off with a controversial <laughs> issue. I'm making the divide. Hey, I'm 100 percent, 50 percent Italian. That's sacrilege. You, you can't do that. Well, on this program, we come with the tough questions first. Yeah, so. okay, I can see that. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. One of, my, one of my personal passions is, is strengthening relationships and right. building understanding, right. understandings between the people that we surround ourselves with each day. Because what, what we've learned is that everybody has a story that's shaped who they are. Right. What's your story? I'm driven as a day is long to make a difference in the lives of children. Uh, each mm -hmm. one of us has a story, and I have a story that clearly goes like this, that I'm uh, from a small town in western Maryland, um, an my grandson of an immigrant, a coal miner from the small town in Italy. My grandfather came over from Italy uh, to find a better way of life, worked real hard, raised his family of 11 children, and I'm his namesake. Uh, and the expectation was that we worked hard. Uh, it didn't matter what your abilities were, but you showed up every day and you worked hard. Uh, through a, so, several personal challenges in my life, uh, my mother passed away when I was a young person. Uh, I was placed in foster care. I understand what poverty is all about. Understanding that when I was in school, received that free and reduced meal ticket that had a red dot on it, that I felt ostracized. I felt different. But I lived in a community uh, where individuals rallied around us, where people cared. And failure wasn't an option, uh, regardless of your life circumstances, that you could prevail. And through a lot of hard work and grit and determination, I wanted to be a teacher and uh, making a difference for, for young people has just driven me my entire, my entire life. Great. So you've only been on the job for a few weeks yeah. at this point, but what are your impressions of the work that lays before you? Right now it's a very interesting transition. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a very, this is a very important time for our county, uh, acknowledging uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we want to go. Uh, my first day on the job spent great time in terms of building those relationships that you referred to, reconnecting, healing the community after many, many years of challenges. And I feel very uniquely positioned to help in that process because I lived in Howard County for 20 years. I raised my family here, my children attended the schools in, this, in the county, uh, and I left to become a superintendent and had the opportunity to be a superintendent in St. Mary's County for, for nine and a half years. Um, also was a state superintendent in West Virginia. That provided me with great perspective. Now coming home uh, to Howard County, uh, my impressions are very clearly that we are a school system that is predicated on relationships, uh, where we care about children first and foremost. The dialogue always has to be around our kids, yes. not just some kids, but all kids, uh, and recognizing the fact that our young people uh, in a very affluent county, not all young people have all the advantages that many may have. There are a lot of dislocated individuals, a lot of disenfranchised individuals, and through a, a dialogue of equity, I want to introduce a very robust vision regarding equity uh, to ensure that every child in the Howard County public school system is, is receiving a high quality education, not just some, but all. So my story is driven by taking care of individuals who are less fortunate, individuals who need additional support, and using the gifts that we have all been provided to help the least fortunate, the children who need additional supports, uh, the ones who need a higher ladder, a longer ladder to get over the wall of success. So that's what drives me every day, and that's what I'm looking forward to engaging the community uh, to ensure that happens every day for our children. That's great. And you led me right into a theme that I wanted to jump into, and that's equity. Right. And you talked extensively about equity in your conversations with yep. community members 
and community leaders. So what does, maybe a little deeper, what does a, an equitable school system look like? Well, and I think first and foremost is the fact that there's two distinct definitions. Mm -hmm. Equitable means equal mm -hmm. uh, across the board. E and so equity is the fact that we are providing individual supports uh, to ensure that children uh, receive those additional supports to help them along the way. Like I've said, if we, if we were to line up 30 children in a classroom, each child is going to perform at a different level. We just can't come in and teach to the middle and say, that because that's equal distribution, but equity is right. providing personalized learning to ensure that every one of those 30 children receives an individualized education. So, so through social emotional intelligence, understanding our children's giftedness, because I firmly believe every child is gifted, and it's up to educators to, to really develop that, that, that giftedness. And so when I think about equity, and I think about talking about uh, equal, they're, 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 they're not uh, related in that right. sense. They're, they're different. So equal is not equity. It's the definition of how we use those terms. So I want the conversation to shift through how we develop our budget, how we develop our programs, how we implement our staffing structures to provide a more issue of equity all across the conversation. It should be a way of life, a way of acting, a way of operating, not just something that we think about at various times throughout the year. It's got to shift the whole culture of our community. And we live in a county that values diversity, that values differences, that values the aspect of a very pluralistic society. And so when we live in that kind of environment, we have to provide uh, the aspect of equity in terms of how we deliver educational uh, services. There was a report um, released by the Aspen Education and Society right. Program and Council of, I wrote this down so I right. wouldn't mess it up, Council of Chief State School Officers called Leading for Equity Opportunities for State Education yep. Chiefs that you're familiar with. Very familiar with it. The report states that to start early, you've got to invest in the youngest learners. Yep. How could a more intense focus on eliminating the opportunity gaps for our youngest learners lead to an impact on the remaining journey through the 12th grade? Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for referencing that uh, report. Uh, when I served, served as a state, state chief in West Virginia, uh, we were instrumental in guiding that, that language. That's mm -hmm. put out from the organization that I was a part of. And I think that Howard County is ripe for that form of implementation, but it really talks about the issues of equity at a very overt level, mm -hmm. uh, at a very systemic level, uh, ensuring the 10 points are embraced uh, to really create that really solid delivery model for our young people. So I will be leading with that report Good. Uh, to develop our vision for our county. I think that we have such a wonderful opportunity to lead the nation uh, in doing the, the work of equity at, at a very higher level. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the early learners, yeah. um, if you understand the research regarding the achievement gap, it truly starts at birth. Mm -hmm. And so when you understand that it should not be predicated on a zip code where a child is born or a family structure where a child is born that determines the rest of the life, we need to intervene early. So most recently, um, my family has been, uh, this wonderful arrival occurred in my family. I had my first grandson. My, my oldest daughter uh, gave birth to my first grandson approximately two months ago. And so when I visited them in the hospital, I watched and I observed the interaction. So there was a number of visits from the doctors, and there was great conversation about immunizations and inoculations mm -hmm. and well baby visits and medical. But there was not one conversation over the course of the two days that she was in the hospital that when I was present about brain development, about developmental issues, about the importance of reading to a child early on, the significance of providing positive language interactions between a child and a mother and father and the adults. There's an expression in the, the French use, it's called enfancing, E-N-F-A-N-C-I-E. And it's that face-to-face -face communication between a child and, and an adult and the mother and the father, the bonding occurring. And when there's love and when there's ex expectation of positive language and when there is reading and a rich language environment, the development occurs at a higher level. But sadly, when young people are born into poverty and the family structure isn't as positive, great challenges occur for that child. And so that troubles me greatly is how we intervene uh, early on. I've already started talking to the leadership at our hospital about providing a prescription for brain development mm. 
hmm. and maturation and development for our children at the same time when we're educating about the importance of immunizations and well baby visits and things such as that. So both of those go in tandem. And so it's an extremely important piece of my vision plan for our county, the expansion of our early childhood programs birth to five is critical mm -hmm. and what we do as a community to advance that will take care of what you said in terms of the journey yeah. because if we're looking for the end in mind if we want every child to graduate it's got to start early on and that's an interesting concept that that's probably fairly new to our community that the journey doesn't start in kindergarten no it starts well before it starts at birth and to have those partnerships those relationships with our community leaders with parents yeah and again and I think we are again Howard County is just well positioned to take that on at a yeah. higher level and be a, be a leader across the nation to get it right. But again, if we are truly understanding the developmental process of young people, that achievement gap actually starts at birth. And I can talk to you forever about a variety of different books. And one I'm most impressed about is uh, the 30, mil the 30 million word, uh, word gap, uh, one of which I read on a regular basis. It talks about this issue greatly. Okay. Now we could sit, I could sit here and speak to you about the 10 commitments in this report sure. all day, but there's one more that I want to focus on before okay. we move forward. And it's, um, it's value people, focus on teachers and leaders. Yep. So it's not just increasing funding to support initiatives, and it's cultivating a staff from top to bottom that, yeah. that looks, at, you know, looks at their students as educators through a lens of equity. Yeah. So as people get to know me better, um, I hope I don't have to tell people this, I just hope that they can see it. First and foremost, I'm a teacher first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I'm driven based upon relationships. I'm an extrovert who has to connect with people. And I recognize that when I was a teacher in a classroom and the superintendent would come into the building, if they wouldn't visit my classroom, I would feel left out. <laughs> like, you know, that was a very significant day. And the connection to the so-called anointed leaders of our community, our county executive, our county council, our community leaders, our board of education members, our superintendents, the significance of that, of building that relationship uh, from top to bottom yep. and acknowledging, the, again, the body of research that says when you connect with the heart, academic achievement actually goes up. So when you build relationships with kids in classrooms, if you believe in children, because kids are honest, they'll know whether you believe in them or whether you don't. They, they, they will tell you right. out of the mouths of babes comes the truth. And they can tell whether you believe in them. So I want teachers in Howard County who believe in all of our children, that we're hiring individuals who understand our culture, who really firmly believe that our kids can and will learn, not just words, but what do we do and how do we respond from a lens of equity. So I go back and I drift back to the Rick DeFores questions, and it's how do we respond when children are failing with urgency and using a lens of equity to provide those differentiated supports. They may need a double dose in math. They may need some additional supports after school. That's why we didn't cut those, uh, those items from our, from our budget. We may need to be innovative and look at how we expand programs over the weekend, utilizing our schools in the evening. All of these are all processes of looking at equity, uh, looking at an educational system through the lens of equity. And again, where, where does our county want to be? Long range vision. How do we want to be defined as we respond to the individuals who are most vulnerable in our school system? And so we shift um, as we move the students through K to 12. Ultimately, we want to prepare them for life after high right. school. And so when we shift into college and career, readiness. Listening right. to you speak recently, you made a comment that, that we want to prepare students for college and career, right. not college or no. career. With state readiness standards mm -hmm. primarily focused on mathematics and English language arts and, and literacy, how can we ensure that we're preparing all students for college and career and really to be life ready? Well, and I think it's an important word, and I use it with uh, intentionality, the conjunction of and versus are. Mm -hmm. um, th those that become critical. I want children to be college and career ready. Now, I also acknowledge that maybe all young people aren't going to go to college mm -hmm. initially. But we have a real social and moral responsibility of my moral imperative to ensure that every child who graduates from the Howard County Public School System has fulfilled the requirements from the state of Maryland. And if you go through a battery of those credits, that young people should be able to achieve what they expect in terms of their life readiness. But I also know very clearly, and we, we need to have a more robust conversation about this, that not all young people are going to go to college. And that we do have individuals who drop out of our schools 
uh, in Howard County. Like I was in my graduation speeches, I talked about our graduation rate being 93% and people applauded. And I said, no, yeah. let's talk about the 7% that didn't make it, that aren't college and career ready and the challenges that they're gonna have in their life. So we have to be able to respond early and intervene when children are failing to ensure they're on the right track, uh, the right path uh, to, to success. So I want to engage further with our community leaders, our elected officials, to say how do we look at our 13th high school in a very different way uh, to provide more opportunities for career readiness, career development. And there's some wonderful, innovative uh, career readiness programs occurring all across the nation that, again, I view that Howard County would be ripe for implementation in a very innovative way, creating simulated workplace environments for our children, where children come in mm -hmm. and actually run the, the, the program as a business. They come in and they check in with their time clock, they have to punch in because employers want people who are on time. Two, we look at the issue of drug testing. We want individuals who are drug free in all the workforce. This is a national epidemic across the nation. And we want individuals who are skilled and we want people to be able to communicate that through this very robust process of delivering a career technology planning program uh, through an actual simulated workplace environment. And I think that our county, again, is ready for that kind of uh, robust inno innovation uh, around the CTE arena, uh, which I think we have some work to do in our county in there. We have a CTE program yep. in, in the ARL building. Right. Do you see expansion there as well as in our schools? I, I do. I mean, uh, if, if I look back, and again, none of this is critical, but the ARL program has been in existence for, for a number of years. It's the same model for the most part mm -hmm. uh, that was here when I was worked mm -hmm. here and when my kids were in school. And, and that's okay to a certain extent. But we need to reinvigorate and reignite that program in a different way to be more connected to the workplace. Uh, to service more young people, to look at things such as simulated workplace environment, to look at hands-on opportunities that are in a, in a non-traditional way, because there are some wonderful careers out there uh, that young people need to be exposed to that will make contributions to our community uh, that are noble professions, that we need to do a better job of uh, ensuring that children know, young people know what those are. Mm -hmm. And so there's great area uh, for expansion an analysis of our CTE arena, and that'll be another pivotal piece in the vision that we'll be implementing over the next several years. You said something a moment ago that I'd like to go back to. You referenced the graduation rate. Right. Um, I'd like to reference another report that was introduced mm -hmm. by you um, to staff, put out by Civic Enterprises called the Silent Epidemic. Right. And it details the perspective of high school dropouts. And basically, in summation, the report tells us that most dropouts could have pre been prevented when asked why they dropped out. Yep. Half of students said the class wasn't interesting. Right. Nearly 70% said they weren't motivated or inspired. Right. And a third of students said that they had to acquire a full-time job in order to support yep. Yep. their family. So the majority of dropouts aren't doing so because of major academic challenges. Right. They're doing so for other reasons it, it, that, that are preventable. So how do we get that 7% that didn't graduate yeah. and, and move that to zero? Well, and the first thing is, is the, the level of connectedness. You have to have a connection yes. to your school. And so I get very impassioned by this because if you go back even further in, in terms of the, that, that report, the first issue that emerges as far as, as, a, as an early warning indicator for children to drop out of school is attendance. Mm. No matter what your abilities are, every family in Howard County can make a decision every day to have their child in school. And when a child does not show up for school, it becomes habitual. So bad habits form and it becomes a way of life. So they just don't show up for school and it leads to dropout. It is the first early warning issue. It has nothing to do with ability or reading levels, but attendance is the number one factor. So I want to focus again about the importance of attendance. The best ability is availability. E exactly, yeah. absolutely. And then understanding the three criteria which you defined were not academic related. Right. They weren't based upon ability, but they were based upon the connection. So as we look at, again, scaffolding, the, the vision plan with social emotional intelligences, uh, personalized learning, restorative practices. Mm -hmm. It gives a sense to a child that they feel welcome and belong and just because they, they make one mistake doesn't mean that they're going to be punished and thrown out of school. How do we use those opportunities as learning to restore the individual so they can proceed li to, through life to be successful? 
The connection with teachers becomes critical. The personalized learning, there's gotta be a connection. And so I'm, a fa I'm fascinated and just in awe of our teachers every day who love our kids. And I say love freely, who love our kids and believe in them. And that's what, what kids need. Adults who love them and believe in them and care about them. Because if you look, as I poll all of my students, no matter what school I've ever been in, I say, tell me the characteristics that you want me to use when I hire teachers. Tell me what those attributes are. The first things that come out of their, out of their, their mouths are somebody who cares about me, that they love me, they respect me, they believe in me. And then they get to the academic proficiencies mm -hmm. and that they work hard and they challenge me. But you know when you're in a classroom and a teacher believes in you, you'll work harder and you'll achieve higher. It's just human nature when somebody believes in you. It's called the Pygmalion effect. If I believe in you, you will. If I believe you won't, you can't, you, you don't. So it's these basic human tenets of relationships that I want to also scaffold in uh, that are significantly important to the well-being of our, of our children in our classrooms. Absolutely. And I, I've talked about uh, graduation rates, dropout rates, um, college and career ready, and every huh. time you've gone back to words um, like equitable, um, uh, understanding, connections, uh, relationships. Right. And so in a profession, education, that's driven m in many ways by data right. and numbers, how can we put the emphasis on creating those relationships with our students, with the community? See, see, some people think because you talk about relationships and you talk about personalized learning and you talk about connections and you talk about equity, that those are not significant in terms of driving an academic ad agenda. I firmly disagree. You have to have those conversations up front and all of your metrics then will take care of themselves. Mm. I mean, it goes back to the psychology of relationships, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the family dynamics. When you have a strong mom and dad leading a family, good things happen for kids. They're nurtured and they're loved and they're taken care of. We have to have high functioning classrooms with caring, competent teachers every day. A system that is driven by how we take care of our people. When, as, as superintendent, I want to lead with the heart. Doesn't mean I'm any less firm or any less committed. I have high expectations, higher than hopefully a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. But because we lead with the heart, you're gonna get more out of our classrooms. You're gonna get trust within communities. You're gonna be able to take care of our children who need additional supports. How do we respond to our students uh, who are most vulnerable? You have to have those conversations. I'm very impassioned by that. I mean, I'm having a hard time staying on this chair because <laughs> it's significant work. Uh, and when you lead an organization around the heart and you care, trust and cooperation start occurring in ways for children that magic happens. Mm. And I see it at the, as we're at the timing of this, I see it when all of those graduations are occurring in the interactions between the children and, and the teachers and the young people and the teachers and the principal. There's love there, yeah. there's care, there's respect. And that's what our county represents, is a community of civility and connections and who, how we treat each other. You know, I use the quote, and you've heard me say it a number of times in graduations, Maya Angelou, I want to be remembered for how we treated people and how we made them mm -hmm. feel, because people will probably forget what I said and usually what I did, but everybody will carry forward how we've treated each other and how we made them feel. Mm. Let's, let's close out on budget, okay. just because it's, a, it's an item that was, yep. that was at the forefront recently, and the Board of Education adopted the fiscal year 2018 budget. I want to raise up three items. Uh, number one, 87 paraeducators right. were added back into the budget. Right. Number two, negotiated salary increases right. were funded. And number three, a position for the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion yep. was added. Why were these three priorities for well, you? Because they're priorities in terms of taking care of our children. Hmm. First and foremost, let me just click those off. One, first and foremost, a negotiated agreement. We have to pay our staff members competitive wages. Uh, this year, everybody will receive the cost of living, and if they're entitled to an increment or a step, that's occurring. No one is being furloughed. We can't treat our people poorly around the realm of labor management issues. We've got to have a very, very robust process of resolving issues and compensating fairly because teaching is a competitive workforce. Our educational leaders, it's a competitive workforce. And we have to, as Howard Countyans, we have to be able to be on the cutting edge of being able to recruit and retain the very best. Yeah. Uh, second, you talked about the issue of uh, the diversity coordinator, mm -hmm. the significance of that. We are driving that agenda at a very higher level around the equity agenda to ensure that 
we value everybody within our community. It's a pluralistic community where we value. We just don't tolerate, we accept. Mm -hmm. And that has to be taught in our schools. We have to embrace that early on. The cultural proficiencies need to be reignited. Are we truly about the, the actions, not just words? How do we conduct ourselves? And we've had some challenges in the last year around some racial tension issues, the responsiveness around those issues. And granted, things are gonna happen we can't be replete of things not happening. We have to be aware that when they do happen, how do we respond? How do we respond with a level of fairness and equity and acceptance and respect of individual differences? So that issue becomes extremely important. It was defined as a diversity coordinator and there was great consternation around that. I viewed that as a very uh, important issue to continue to keep in the budget, but not only keep it in the budget, I didn't want it buried several mm -hmm. steps down in the organizational chart. I've defined the, the, the title now as the diversity, inclusion, and equity director, mm -hmm. reporting directly to the superintendent and making certain that, that piece is there. The third prong of which you talked about created me great uh, consternation was the elimination of paraeducators. Uh, first and foremost, my sister is a paraeducator in, an, in a, another county in Maryland, and the, and the work she does uh, for children, the, she's an unsung hero in her yeah. school in Western Maryland. And I value the work of which she does every day, and I value the work of paraeducators in my entire career. The, the research, both qualitative and quantitative, supports academic achievement when you have a high-performing paraeducator paired with a high-performing teacher. Uh, you can break down that class size even further. Young people are receiving individualized uh, assessments and services and interventions. Uh, and, the, and again, the research supports that interaction. We took away 87 of them. We've also, through that process, we're closing down media centers in, all, in our schools. My first day on the job, I visited Wild Lake Middle School, and the media specialist there broke my heart. But she spoke to me, used that opportunity to speak to me in a very impassioned way to say, Dr. Martirano, there's no kids in here. I'm the testing coordinator. I'm taking care of technology. I'm responding to all the various firefighting issues that need to occur, and the center is closed. This is a brand new school, Brian, where we put millions of dollars into it, and the media center is closed. The media center should be a hub of learning. We should have, it should be a safe place for children to go uh, if they're feeling harassed or bullied. It should be a place for us to have interventions. It should be a place on weekends where we develop a learning hub to access the internet. Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities when we're putting taxpayer dollars into these very robust facilities and we're closing them. Right. That's unconscionable. Mm -hmm. It's egregious. So I feel very good in terms of uh, implementing a, an, an agenda of equity and through my own value system, ensuring that all of those media centers will be open as we kick off the school year this year. And I feel real good about that because kids will be receiving the service of which they are entitled to. That's great. And, and back to relationships. Right. And back to relationships. Whether you're the president working with Congress, superintendent working with the board, uh, the budget details your priorities for the right. year. And it requires relationships, good relationships, right. yep. um, to get it done. Talk about some of the relationships that you aim to, to establish with, with the board, with uh, yeah. local elected leaders in the county, with, with the county executive throughout the process. It, it, it's, it's absolutely critical. I've done this work uh, nine and a half years at the local level, three years at the state level. I've worked with governors, senators, delegates, local boards of education. I've supervised superintendents, uh, worked with county councils, county executives. And we have to recognize as a superintendent, I'm hired by the school board. I report to the board of education to achieve their goals and missions that they want to have happen. But we also know that we advocate together for our funding sources. In the state of Maryland, the majority of our dollars, they basically come from three buckets. Uh, because of our wealth index, the majority of our funding comes from the county council, our taxpayers generated. Uh, second, our state taxpayer dollars uh, go from the state funding we receive. And then a small portion in terms of entitlements from the federal government, the mm -hmm. three buckets of money that support public education. So the best thing that I can continue to do as a, as a very active leader, relationship driven, is have good working relationships with all of our stakeholders, our county council members, our county executive, our state delegation, our governor, uh, our, all of our individuals across who provide and make the decisions to allocate funding. When there's tensions amongst adults, things create challenges then for then how things are funded. 
I have to work every day to ensure that those relationships are good so that our children don't suffer. And we receive every dollar that Howard County is entitled to, both at the federal, state, and local level. It's a major part of the superintendency job, and you have to work heavily on those relationships every day. I am thankful to our county council, to our board of education, mm -hmm. and our county executive, because when the transition occurred, there was about a week <laughs> to shift that budget and mm -hmm. those priorities. They allowed that to occur by working collaboratively with our board and reestablishing those priorities so children would not suffer on that first day of school, that teachers would be taken care of, that our staff would be taken care of. And I'm extremely proud of that work because the, the opportunity to say that this fiscal year budget has the handprints of an equitable, has an, in terms of equity, all over it exists. So it's more than just words, it's beliefs and actions that are in that budget right now. That's great. Um, I appreciate your time today. I, I know that staff and has appreciated all the time that you've spent yeah. so far in our schools and in our offices. And I know the, the, that the um, community appreciates you coming on here and speaking to those that haven't had a chance to meet you yet. So we'll end with this. What are your priorities for the remainder of this year and heading into the next school year? What, what are you looking to accomplish? Well, uh, that's interesting because I've only been here uh, slightly over a month that's probably right. by the time this airs. <laughs> and so we've accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. I'm, I'm looking at the, the job now in several different themes. One is to continue to build relationships and heal as we move forward. That's a significant piece. Uh, second is to then respond to all the firefighting that has to occur and allow us to end the school year on a very positive note and engage, you know, with a staff that they're still getting to know me, you know, in that sense, still work, working on all of our relationships. But the work is so important that we have to drive forward. And the third prong is where I really want to rest, you know, in terms of, you know, providing the quality work is defining that vision, thinking proactive, thinking with the end in mind and implementing a robust agenda that will define our future work in a collaborative way with our business community and stakeholders to advance a very robust agenda of equity uh, for all of our children uh, in Howard County. And uh, I've been blessed with a little bit of energy <laughs> and I'm saying I'm trying to be calm here, but I've been blessed with a little bit of energy and I'm devoting my entire professional uh, life to, to the betterment of the students in Howard County. That, that's my passion and commitment and my promise to the community uh, where I believe you have to have somebody in the superintendency position that you can trust and believe in to lead our system. And um, I'm very honored and humbled to be serving the position right now. Well, your energy and your passion are infectious. And, and we're all feeding off of it. Good. So we all appreciate that. Thank you. And thanks for coming in. We'll have to, we'd love to have you back so we can dig into some of these other issues a little, a little deeper than, than we could today. Absolutely. We could spend and all I, day on all 10 commitments, right? And we could, and I'm not shy, so I've never met a microphone I wouldn't talk to. So thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's all the time that we've got for this conversation. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Martirano for giving his time today. If you'd like to, con to continue hearing directly from the superintendent, be sure to follow him on Twitter at MJM Super, where he's very active. I'd also like to thank you for spending your time with us today. If you have any follow-up questions, please be sure to contact us at insight at hcpss.org, and I'll be sure to respond quickly. Finally, thank you to the crew working behind the scenes of HCPSS Insight. For Dr. Martirano and everybody here at HCPSS Insight, I'm Brian Bassett. Thank you for watching. <laughs>